Once upon a time on Prompted, Erin writes a classic sci-fi, Bella's character swallows a realtor whole, and Izzy sums up her first year Freshers' Week in poetic verse. And the Prompted gang have a talented celebrity guest. Bella, hit the theme tune. doing i'm hitting the theme tune you've literally asked me to hit the theme tune 500 times since we started this podcast and i'm finally doing it so please don't be annoyed at me but i didn't expect you to actually make one yes i made one I is never that official di- it's official i never disappoint this theme tune will be in every episode from now on i will be queen of prompted by the end of this series however we do have another queen on this call and Nancy, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Nancy Stolman. I'm actually across the pond with you guys today, so um, <laughs> very happy to be here. We're very excited to have a celebrity guest. <laughs> do you want to tell us about uh, what you do, Nancy? Sure, yeah. So um, I am mostly a flash fiction writer, and uh, I'll talk all about flash fiction in the episode, but uh, I was particularly invited to be here today because my new book, Going Short, An Invitation to Flash Fiction, is releasing now, basically. And it has been a labor of love for many, many years. And I basically put everything that I know about writing and teaching flash fiction into one book. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to talk about that with you guys today. Well, this is the perfect podcast for that because we're all about prompts and flash fiction. Izzy, what was the prompt for this week? Yeah, so the prompt for this week is, the first thing she said to me was, you have a very nice energy. Where does this prompt come from, Izzy? So this prompt comes from, um, I was writing up the episode plan because I wanted to send it across to Nancy and I realised that I didn't have any idea what our prompt was for this week. So I quickly messaged a chat and our lovely friend Kenneth came to the rescue and says that that was the strangest thing, the strangest thing that someone had ever said to him was, you have a really nice energy. Not, not that it's strange, but he thought it was really interesting because it was just at a random party, this girl came up to him and said that. He does have a nice energy, to be fair. I'm going to be honest, I thought it was Bella who said this. You thought it was me? (laughs) Look, I know I'm very hippy-dippy and a bit of a witch, but I don't just go around telling people they have (laughs) nice energy, I swear. So you're saying (laughs) that we don't have nice energy? Oh, you all have horrible energy. No, I'm joking. (laughs) You all have great energy. Not that I'm very experienced in energy yet. (laughs) Okay, so what what did everyone write? Because I basically took the good energy thing and completely turned it on its head. With the horror. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I wrote, well, at first I took the energy thing and I wrote a piece about hiking and then I reread it and hated it and didn't know how to finish it. I, I will finish it one day, but so that I then spent the day basically going through my diary from first year and turning it into a poem oh wait your diary and, and that comes from first year yeah i i took the meeting people part of the prompt the first thing she said to me prompt and so yeah that's what i've done am i the main character in your diary from first year <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> my i want to mention is he i want to be a side character for context, Nancy. Oh, Erin, it's about. <laughs> yeah, for context, Nancy, Izzy and I lived in halls together in first year. And that's uh, where we met. Yes. Um, yeah. It's all making sense now. Um, I took energy and just put it in a sci fi setting because that's me. That's what Erin does. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be prompted if we didn't start off the first episode with Erin writing a sci fi. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what Erin does, and she's incredibly good at it. Speaking of Erin's piece, <laughs> let's go into Erin's piece. Okay, take it away, Nancy. Come on, come on, work. I muttered under my breath. The ship juddered. 
The computer monitor pixelated and only corrected itself when I hit it with the side of my fist. Another jolt and a heap of metal and parts slid off the workbench. I dived for the computer cord, keeping it plugged in. Trailed from the machinery, along the desk, halfway across the floor, then coiled up the side of the android hanging in the maintenance rig suspended from the ceiling. He swung gently as the ship hit more turbulence, a big spot this time. Messy! Update now! I snapped. Blocks of text scrolled across my field of vision. The upside of the ship's AI being directly linked to my brain was that the information transfer was fast. The downside? Messy let me know exactly how annoyed she was that I wasn't at navigation. I should have been helping her, but that would mean leaving Lupus alone. I didn't want to risk that. As if on cue, the computer let out a bleep, which was echoed by the android's voice box. His eyes opened. You with me? The ship tilted alarmingly. I grabbed at the computer again to keep it steady. Lupus? We good? We are good. He stated calmly. He reached his arms up for the rig release switch. Don't. Just stay put for now. I still haven't... A warning alarm started blaring. Oh, for the love of... Messy, just keep the ship in a straight line. If you damage the paint with more space debris again, I am not going to be happy. The text that scrolled across my eyes appeared in angry all caps. I turned to Lupus, who was awkwardly trying to hit the release switch. I said don't! Stay in the rig! Why must I? Because your leg is on the floor over there! Lupus looked down. He was missing the limb up to his hip. The remaining leg was twisted, his ankle facing forwards. Ah, he said calmly. This is a problem. The ship shuddered violently. Lupus swung in the rig. I was sent flying across the room. He put out a hand missing three fingers and caught me, wrenching my shoulder. Messy! I yelled. I am going to kill you for that. The words all clear scrolled across my vision. I let out a sigh of relief. Messiah? Lupus asked. She's fine. She got us out in the nick of time, like always. I'm sure she's just showing off. I need to check none of the damage is too bad. You are getting blood on the monitor, Calypso. I checked. The long gash on my arm was bleeding through the material I hastily tied around it. Great. Just what I need. I can do it. Leap us off it. I was too tired to argue. I pulled a chair and a first aid kit over to him. He reached up to the rig controls and lowered himself down to my height. His broken leg leg grated dismally across the metal floor. The plan did not go well, he said quietly. It would have gone fine if you'd stuck to it. Running off like that was stupid and... Ow! He flinched at the same time as I did. I apologise. I thought that course of action would improve our chances of success. Did we achieve anything? Messi got a few files in the download before we had to take off. I'll get her to analyze them, and I'll process them when I'm sleeping. You need to sleep, naturally. He started unwinding a clean bandage. The interface between you and Messiah should not be on permanently. It's fine, honestly. You were not designed to be a symbiotic being. You drain each other. She should never have done it. Well, she did. You heard what she said. I'm a compatible pilot. Her systems run better with me. Besides, I run on caffeine and adrenaline even before I found Messi. Messiah cannot function as well if you are sleep deprived. The fans of his calling system whirred into life, stuttered and fell quiet. Didn't sound good. I knew better than to offer help. He hadn't let me go near his system since I first fixed him. Pride, maybe, or stubbornness. He could have learned that from me. Carelessly, like I was tidying up, I loaded his broken leg in the toolbox onto a trolley loaded with welding equipment and a relatively unbroken computer monitor. I slid it towards him. He caught it. If you go into systems failure, Messi will tell me. Yes. And Lupus? I pulled my jacket sleeve down over the bandage. That was really stupid. Running off like that? Don't let it happen again. The files aren't worth it. Mm. A wonderful sci-fi piece as always, Erin. Yay, sci-fi. I just love how you focus on... There's always some really interesting character relationships in every single sci-fi piece you write. Because I love your philosophy that sci-fi is just about humans people who are well not necessarily humans they're all but, humans oh gosh I don't know it's just beings. beings who are flung together and they have to get along somehow 
I was going to say that because what we're trying to do with this season is stick to uh, a certain set of characters. Could you talk us through are these are these three of the characters that you're you're working with this season? Uh, I think so. I hope I've actually figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, Calypso is linked to the ship, so they're trying to find a way to unlink her from the ship, and it's just going very badly, like all these little missions do. Uh, so hopefully they'll pop up again and won't we'll, we'll be in one piece that would be ideal <laughs> that's quite exciting I'm, I'm excited to hear more about calypso and lupus Yay. i was just gonna say that one of the things i noticed about this piece which i talk about a lot in flash fiction is this this idea of like zooming into like a high tension moment without mm. the background without the explanation without the scene setting just kind of throwing the reader into the high moment and letting them figure it out is just so much more satisfying than like well let me tell you all this stuff before i can get to like the actual scene and so i thought that you did that really well do you like doing like a slow reveals for flash fiction then? Um, well, I mean, there's so many ways that you can approach it, but um, this is the very first one that I always teach all my students, which I call it the zoom, the zoom lens. So like thinking of a big story, but then just picking five high tension moment or five minutes in that mm -hmm. story, just what's the most important five minutes and just, just telling us the five minutes. Don't go outside of the five minutes, you know? And so I sort of saw that happening naturally here. There's a technique in improv where you, um, improvised theatre, where you have to start a scene in immediate mm -hmm. res, so in the middle of the action, and you've got to go into the scene knowing that if someone were to hit a rewind button, you'd be able to show them all of the action that came before kind of thing. But obviously, you let the audience figure that out for themselves. Yeah, and I think that's so much more satisfying for an audience. I mean, I think that like when you chew and digest everything for the audience and then just kind of spit it out to them already digested, it's not nearly as fun as making them kind of figure it out. Um, and then there's a, a feeling of like ownership of the story or, or the acting, whatever it might be, where it's like they figured it out themselves and now they feel like part of the joke or part of the story or whatever. So. The most fun part of reading, I find as well, is having to actually sit there and figure out what's going on. Uh, if I was just spoon-fed everything in a piece, then it wouldn't be nearly as interesting to read. Exactly. So, how do we feel about moving on to my piece? <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us what you're being you're... spooked. I heard the very exit. Bella wrote this piece while um, in the same kitchen as me, socially distanced, of course. And I just heard the very end line, and I was like, "That's the very Bella piece." <laughs> of course, she wrote something like that. <laughs> so, uh, over last year, I sort of changed my genre a little bit. I used to write a lot of realism, um, quite kitchen sink realism, and a bit of comedy but dark comedy um, and as the years gone on I've actually got more into sort of activist literature and a little bit of sci-fi a little bit of dystopia speculative fiction uh, so I'm, I'm encroaching a little bit on Erin's territory which I don't I don't want to do because Erin is <laughs> the master it's not my territory I do not have a you're, territory <laughs> you're the master of sci-fi I'm prompted I, I want to I I wanna leave it to you but, uh, so this week I went for horror because I'm trying genres I've never tried before. Um, and this is actually quite interesting because I was trying to figure out what kind of characters I wanted to include this season. And my housemate gave me the idea um, of one of these characters by talking about one of their ex-girlfriends. Um, <laughs> who sounded like a very, very interesting character. Um, she didn't believe in shoes, uh, time, space, or mountains. Which was... Apparently they had a whole discussion one time where my housemate showed her pictures of like Everest and other <laughs> big mountains and went, well, what is this then? And she went, it's just a hill. So... <laughs> she sounded fascinating, so I thought... 
I'm writing a horror piece. How bad would it be for me to turn her into an eldritch horror monster? Like, not, not, and no offense to, <laughs> no offense to her, but kind of like, <laughs> that's what ended up happening. <laughs> So, Nancy, if this if this episode never never goes on air, it's because we've all been eaten by an elder. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, you know, if people weren't so weird, they wouldn't get turned into characters. So it's really her <laughs> fault. <Absolutely. you> know? <laughs> yeah, I do take a lot of inspiration from people around me, as Izzy and Erin definitely know, because I did have four characters, three of which were guys that I lived with last year. That's really um, what they get. <laughs> yeah, I mean that I they signed on for it. I gave them the contract and said you'll probably be turned into pieces. So you just have to you have to deal with that. Um so anyway, this is this is my piece. Erin, mm-hmm. take us away. That'll have to go. The realtor pocketed the keys and frowned at his client. She wore what appeared to be a pink floral nightgown and nothing else. Her hair looked electric and she wasn't wearing shoes. He watched as she flipped the oil painting in the hall. All the furniture is optional. He stepped closer to her and eyed the painting himself. It was pretty standard, a thick textured rendition of Everest peering over a smudged cloud line. You don't like the art? I don't believe in mountains. She sucked idly on her forefinger. Do you? He blinked. Uh, yes. She snorted and spun away from the landscape, traipsing instead into the living room. It was painted a sunny yellow that clashed noisily with the lime sofa cushions. She appeared pleased, wiggling her bare toes deep into the carpet. He cleared his throat. Miss Craft, was it? Marnie. Marnie, what is your budget exactly? Hmm? She bent perpendicular at the waist and closed her eyes. Money is irrelevant. Well... Should we go upstairs? Upstairs was slightly less jarring. The windows were narrow and north-facing, and cast a gauzy grey light over the landing. The shadows in the corners appeared almost to move, creeping closer and closer over the floorboards. So... The realtor said, peering through the dust motes. What is it you do for a living? Marnie's pale, round face was like a headlight in the gloom. I'm a poet. He knew poetry, had read some Whitman, a little Ashbury, and even a Dickinson or two. Are you published? She scoffed again and moved into the bedroom. The mirror was speckled with black, the bed naked and stained. She drew the sickly green curtains, which gave the space a kind of swamp-like glow. The rent might seem more than it's worth, but the area's nice. There's a train station not far. And they hold a market in town on a Saturday. She kept his back to him. What are your thoughts? She ran her hand along the drapes as if checking for dust and then turned, bones twisting and creaking. Her hair fell off her in matted red clumps. Her eyes disappeared into her scalp entirely. She ran a long, swollen tongue along her palm. Yes, she said in a voice different from before. This will do quite nicely. The realtor's clipboard clattered to the floor as she approached. He didn't even have time to scream before she unlocked her jaw and swallowed him whole. Gulp. (laughs) Gulp. The, um, he didn't even have time to scream before she unlocked her jaw and swallowed him whole is the only line that I heard when Bella wrote this. (laughs) And so that's why Uh, I was like, okay. (laughs) I mean, I needed to have a woman who ended up being an eldritch horror monster swallowing a man. It's just how I felt in that moment, you know? <laughs> I love the description of her transforming. It's so unsettling. I'm glad you liked it. It was made more unsettling by your change of tone after it yeah, happened. You, you didn't tell me the voice changed, Bella. I had to improvise. Well, you do improvisation. I, I thought you would you would catch on. <laughs> it's not like I do improv sessions twice a week or anything. <laughs> oh, I'm just actually going back. This is one of these stories that it's like you get to the end and then it kind of um, compels you to go back to the beginning and just look for the clues, you know? So I, I love that. I love 
the way that this is kind of like forcing me to go back to the beginning and then read it again with that new knowledge. So it's kind of like unpeeling, like an onion. I love it. When I wrote her, I kind of wanted to go for the vibe of an alien who's on Earth for the first time and doesn't quite know how to pretend to be human. So she's being incredibly <laughs> odd in moments. Yeah. Not- I love that she just seems like an awkward customer like I've worked in retail some people just are bad at answering your questions and so that's what I was relating to and then obviously it's oh no she's not awkward she's just about to eat the real time <laughs> right <laughs> yes I was thinking that watching some uh, I will not name political debates recently and just thinking like is that person going to bust into being a giant insect? Are they actually human? <laughs> like, I'm not sure but if they did I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> The, the next episode of 2020, it's, just how bad can exactly. it get? Everyone's actually just lizards. Right. All of, all of the billionaires and politicians, they're all just lizards and they're going to reveal themselves very soon. Any moment. <laughs> I should have I should have made just, the realtor, I should have changed the realtor into a billionaire and played on the whole eat the rich thing. Ah. I just, just thought of that in my head. Ah. Yes, you could say something about him, like, you know, having been to Everest himself on one of his, like, fancy yeah. trips. So. Yeah, I should have just changed yeah. this sort of setting entirely. Like, he's just a really, really rich man and gets eaten by a strange looking woman who is actually an eldritch monster in disguise. <laughs> I do love the character trait of doesn't believe in mountains because I really want to see them believe someone who's been to all of the effort to climb a mountain and just have her undermine this person's whole gap year. Well, it couldn't have been that hard. It was just a very big hill. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I did ask my housemate, did she believe in volcanoes? And they said, Mm. yes, she believed in volcanoes, just not mountains. And I was expecting them to come out with no, she just thought they were spicy hills. Um, <laughs> so I was a bit disappointed. Hills, bite. hills with indigestion. Right? I'm trying to think of a way to segue, segue this onto Izzy's piece, but indigestion is, is not, a, not a great way of doing it. Well, I, I was just thinking how, speaking of feeling like I'm not, I'm pretending to be a human in this this world this social climate um izzy what was your first impression of me <laughs> segway <laughs> there we go master of um, segways my first impression of bella is actually hidden under many metaphors because she'd probably kill me if i actually explained what our first encounter was <laughs> so, mm-hmm. we, we shall see how it goes so yeah this is my diary turned into a poem about because I was thinking about everyone's first um, experiences on their first few days at uni. So Erin doesn't feature because I met Erin a few weeks in, and because um, I was th- thinking about how the freshers now have got a completely different experience to what I would have had, and so I was thinking back to my first year. Here we go. It's called. It's a poem called "The First Thing They Said to Me Was." Parents driving away down the village that wipes the slate clean once a year. Hair spilling into daisy shirts, melting into daisy jeans. Future dreams in a nest of decorative pillows and fairy lights, copy and pasted from a Wilco catalogue. Bright cotton over the grey duvet. A grisly day through the glass, but sunny days framed on the white walls. Tins stacked on shelves just in case, an empty suitcase sitting next to the cider in the copper bag corner steps away from the flatmates that I've been flung with in the kitchen we share because the questionnaire said we should meet as soon as I have the courage to walk through the door. The questions. What are you studying? Where are you from? What accommodation are you in? A silent game of cards, trying hard not to be seen as I note their names on my phone, then small talk shows we all have tickets for the same night. The quiet cowboy lost at the door, not ready not ready to explore his new freedom but the rest of us are already at the bar a five pound round music's too loud let's go upstairs truth or dare a silent circle dancing to r&b common interests still under lock and key waking up at noon knock at the door i'll be ready soon 
blending makeup with messages from friends about how my first night was, opening the door to a timer on a tablet testing how long I take to get ready, off to an old friend's flat that fate put a few doors down. We find a free pizza stand, then hide behind Blackadder and Doctor Who, a new life can start on Monday because a campus of strangers is too much for a Sunday. Want to meet my flatmates though? Everyone take a seat, take a sip, shuffle Spotify and break the ice. Never have I ever overshared. Group photos of Gary and Gertrude, the garlic twins, and the flat. Touring rooms, racing wheelie chairs and facing serial wars. Paranoid peanut butter cowboys flipping coins, telling the tales of secret crushes about to flop. Flamingos, wizards, ketchup. Each of us exposed, boiled, reduced to one scandal, one savage, one princess, one alcoholic, one lightweight, one fighter, one DJ, one adoptee, and me, Tree. A nickname based on the first drunken mistake I made when I leapt through the ring of fire, drew a card, nine, that means rhyme, and tried to rhyme fridge with tree. Oh god, there's so much context that needs explaining. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you are a poet. How did you try and rhyme fridge with tree? Well, that's why she then got the nickname because we were we were playing Ring of Fire and the rhyme that we all had to rhyme with was fridge. And Izzy was the next person in the circle and just very dreamily went tree, which, <laughs> we, knowing I was on the same creative writing course as her, sat across the table like, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting, though, because for me, having not known any of the context, I didn't feel left out at all. Like, I just feel like that I could imagine any number of people having these sort of experiences. And just like you were saying, we were saying earlier, like, even without knowing the background, I could, like, situate myself in what was happening and feel like it was real. So, um, yeah, for what it's worth. Is it the same kind of things you see every year with your students when you have new students every year (laughs) you know I think so and and it because of course I have my own experiences like as a student myself and then being um, a university professor it's like every year I do sort of see this like rash of excitement and then of course I watch the like break down and break through hopefully (laughs) you know especially in that first semester um, and just kind of watching things happen, even in classrooms, you watch the friendships happen, you watch the relationships happen, you watch the person who was like, you know, in the front row suddenly move to the back row and the back row moved to the front row. And uh, even just in the space of one semester, you just watch a lot of maturity. So yeah, the first day of arriving, I mean, it's really like children becoming adults, you know. I do definitely relate to that children becoming adults it happened very fast Mm -hmm. Mm. just thrown in the deep end yeah (laughs) yep because first term happens at like a million miles an hour because you're at uni you're put with such a mix of different people and so it's so straight because I come from a town and I my friends growing up I met in nursery most of them the others I met in primary school so suddenly going to university and a load of people are thrown at you and it's kind of about seeing what sticks and at the same time you have to um, keep on top of your studies as well as work out what hobbies you want to kind of explore what which ones have to drop it's just such a crazy time and I think I find it weird writing about my university experience because I think that a lot of people, a lot of creative writing students, I think that's one of the first things they write about when they go to uni. I think some of the um, first assignments I handed in were about stuff that happens at uni. So I was kind of worried about not being original, but then I thought as everything's so crazy at uni this year, it might be quite nice just to go to something that's so, yeah, something that's so repetitive, it happens every year. Everyone has similar experiences. Yeah. Well, it's nice to Yeah, this actually. year is completely different. Yeah, I I was going to say, because it's so completely different, it's nice to sort of return to what university was like before things changed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's nice to be nostalgic, I think. Mm. And I think a lot of... I was surprised about a lot of the first few days of uni is obviously about my flatmates and the people who I was living with. And so at least the freshers still have that this year. At least they've still got their flatmates and, yeah... Well, I've been to two different universities. I went to Durham first and 
didn't gel with that place at all. So um, I didn't quite fit in and it was a shame, but it then meant that if I had gone to the right university first, then I wouldn't have met the flatmates that I met when I did it the second time round at Warwick. So I, I wouldn't have met Izzy, I wouldn't have met Erin. It would have been a whole different thing if I'd gone to Warwick first instead of making the mistake at Durham first, if that makes sense. So it's it's nice to think about how great our first year was compared to my first first year, if that makes sense. <laughs> I will say my favourite line actually, because I absolutely love poetry and I was really excited when Izzy said that she wrote some. Um, I really liked Where Is It? Um, and it's such a simple line as well, flamingos, wizards, ketchup, because it, those three things are just completely different things, but they completely sum up the entire first term and I don't know why. Um, um, they are all synonyms of our code names from all of our crushes that term. Wait, no! <laughs> what were you guys doing? That's so complicated. Oh my goodness. Fl- I, I know the wizards one. I know the wizards one. I don't know the flamingos and ketchup one. You're going to have to tell me about that after this. I'll tell you later. Yeah, I can't think what flamingos and ketchup is. What were you guys getting up to while I was... Off elsewhere, goodness. <laughs> Madness. <laughs> see, see that was, that was Izzy and Bella's life before Erin came along and just... Grounded us. <laughs> normality. I did not yeah, ground exactly. you. I introduced you to aliens more than you already had been. Anyway. Oh, that's true. I really liked the line, um, never have I ever overshared. Um, on several levels, just because I think that like that's pretty funny that that's like what you've never done or what the character's never done. But then this sort of like never have I ever at least making me think of like you know the truth and ga- truth and dare and um, the sort of like games talking games that people play. You know, I immediately was like, oh yes, I know exactly what game they're playing. You know? um, so I thought that was a nice kind of shortcut. It was. Yeah, I'm glad you liked that line. That was one of the first lines that I wrote when I was writing the piece because, yeah, it, de- it definitely, um, when I came to uni, it was on the second night that our flatmates all sort of broke the ice and kind of knew that we were all going to get along and become this little family because we played a load of games like that and it was really wholesome. And then the overshared bit is a little dig at Bella. <laughs> 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 I want to take credit for officially breaking the ice because everyone was so nervous as we were playing Never Have I Ever and saying really like shy things like, oh, never have I ever done a shot of vodka, ha ha ha. And I thought, no, this is not working. Everyone's being far too shy. And I told everyone off for not being scandalous enough and then came out with a very scandalous confession. And after that, <laughs> everyone... Rat, just got to know know each other far too much having only known each other 48 hours already so i i'm gonna i'm gonna take credit i think that. that shows real leadership you know <laughs> i i didn't just break the ice i took a massive mallet and just smashed the ice into many many pieces i mean it worked we were all, all thankful for it Okay, uh, speaking of new people and new things, Nancy has just published a new book. I have. I'm so excited that you invited me here to talk about it, too, Um, because this is my first uh, craft book, what I'm calling it a craft book. Um, Most of my books have been fiction. They have been um, flash fiction collections or flash novels um, or anthologies. And then this one is actually uh, a craft book. So I'm calling it a craft book as opposed to like a textbook, because I think of a textbook as kind of um, a little bit more dry. And this is really much more about, you know, everything that I have learned reading, writing, and teaching flash fiction for a dozen years. And so it's really kind of like having a conversation with me and um, while having like a workshop with me and while just sort of chatting. So... Um, it could be used in a classroom, but it's not like exercise one, do this, exercise two, do that. It's not like that at all. I was going to say that's really cool because it's actually, I think, kind of like the books that we have to buy in our creative writing course, sort of really sort of creative books on how to write fiction or poetry or flash fiction. Um, 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, I I think I've kind of read kind of what you're talking about. I like that you call it a craft book. That sounds much more fun than a textbook. Exactly. Um, I get why you, I get why you've called it that. Um, no, I'd be actually be really interested in in reading it. I'll have to. Is it available now or? It is, it is coming out in one week. Yeah. So pre-orders for one more week, but she's actually started mailing them now because, um, the publishers in the UK, I'm in the U S it took two weeks for me to get my proof. So she's like, all right, I'm getting things in the mail now. So she started mailing the pre-orders already. So they're going to start showing up at people's, um, addresses probably as soon as Monday. So, um, I would say, yes, it's happening, but, um, Yeah, it's just been a really great experience for me. Uh, And I would say that books that I was really inspired by in terms of this craft book idea, maybe these are the kinds of books that you're even reading, so we'll see. Um, But of course, like classics like Writing Down the Bones um, is like a really great example of like having that kind of creative conversation. I really like a book called um, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Uh, which has these tiny, tiny little chapters, um, as does my book have really tiny little chapters. Um, Even a book like Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont, where she has sort of a cheeky, sort of fun voice throughout it. Um, All of those were books that I really resonated with when I kind of approached this. And I'll tell you, this is the hardest book I've ever written, and I've written a lot of books. And um, I think it's because... Most of the time when I sit down to write a book, I'm writing fiction, I'm writing stories, I'm writing, you know, uh, whatever, and I'm not thinking about my audience, I'm not thinking about publication purposefully. Like, I don't want to be thinking about, will people like this, you know, because then I think if you're, if you're thinking about your audience too much when you're writing creatively, then you start to pander to your audience and you start to kind of cater to what you think they want rather than actually being really true to your vision. So that's kind of the way I always approach writing. But writing this book, which is really intended for readers to understand exactly what I'm saying, I really had to think about my readers all the time. And that was a really new experience for me because I'm not used to like really thinking about my reader as I'm writing it, almost as if I'm having a conversation with my reader. Um, So it took me a long time. I started writing this book in 2012 and it's now being published. It was supposed to come out, of course, earlier than this, but then we had, you know, the apocalypse and stuff. And so it's coming (laughs) out now. But um, yeah, it's been eight years from start to finish, basically. So I would say that. And when I first started writing this book, I was like, "Uh, you know, I've been writing flash fiction for years. I've been teaching it for years. This will be easy. I'm just going to put down everything I know in a book and boom, it's going to be done. And no, it was it was really a challenge, but I'm so proud of it. What, what are your sort of flash fiction top tips that you put in your book? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I could narrow it down to just the top tips, but I definitely think about it from a couple different angles. So I talk a lot about because I was really trying to picture my reader being a number of people. It could be people who don't really know what flash fiction is, but are curious to try it could be people who already write flash fiction and want to improve you know or it could be people who've been writing flash fiction for a long time and are kind of ready to take another step into putting together collection and stuff like that so I was really trying to think about how could I be welcoming for all of these audiences so I ended up writing it in sections so there's a whole section on writing flash fiction and I definitely expect my reader to come with basic creative writing knowledge. I don't start from the very beginning on, you know, basics of creative writing. Um, But I really kind of jump in in, in, as to where is flash fiction different, like starting with like, what is it and what is it not? And, And like debunking all the myths and all the like things that I hear from people all the time, including like, how is it different from prose poetry? And like, um, I, Oh, flash fiction is great for short attention spans, you know, and all these kind of mythologies that surround that surround flash fiction from an outside point of view. I, I think once people know what it is, they stop asking those questions. But um, so I kind of address those, but in a sort of like fun and cheeky way, mostly. Um, and 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 other sort of mythologies. This idea that like 
oh, flash fiction is a great thing to start writing so that you can then move on to something more complicated. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think that um, writing something very tiny and small and complete and sculpted is often much harder than just kind of having free reign and writing something as long as you want. I think that it takes a whole different set of skills, um, a whole different sort of um, uh, attention to like what is necessary in a story and what is just like fun for the writer to write, you know, like really kind of asking the story, like what does the story need as opposed to like, what does the author want to write? Um, and, and just this idea too of like bigger is, is better. You know, I think that the publishing industry, industry is really kind of given us this thought that like certain things are sellable and publishable and certain things are not. And you know, that, that, um, that flash fiction is really kind of the new kid on the block. And so I think a lot of times people will be very dismissive of it, thinking it's sort of like a fad or that it's like a party trick, you know, or um, that sort of thing rather than realizing, okay, really what flash fiction is doing is it's taking all the, all the knowledge around narrative from a long form fiction or long form prose and all the knowledge around like compression and brevity and language from poetry and putting them together. So you're really getting what's coming at the crossroads of like the novel and the poem. And so I think that it takes like more skill. I don't think it's, it's for beginners Mm. myself. I feel that with flash fiction, there must be more scrutiny almost because when there's with a whole novel, there's, probably some room to for some bits to be better than others whereas in flash fiction almost every every sentence every word has to be exact like has to be sending exactly what you want it to send has to be giving has to be almost be perfect because there's less of it to read if that makes sense so it yep. has to all be mm. absolutely it, on point which i imagine is quite difficult to do it is. And you get better at it, obviously, the more you do it. But it's sort of just like cultivating another lens. I think, you know, I, I haven't written a lot of poetry. I, I definitely have written poetry, but I haven't published a lot of poetry. It hasn't been my focus. But when I get into poetry, I kind of have to shift my lens. I have to think about the world through a poetic lens rather than through like a narrative lens. And I think it's just a shift there. Um, And I think the same thing has to happen with flash fiction. You kind of have to flip into like the flash fiction lens a little bit. And you're right. There's no extra, like there's zero extra. And Mm -hmm. you get really good at realizing like, what has to stay and what has to go. And I, um, so the second section of my book, the first section is about writing it. The second section I actually call sculpting because I think that that's really what happens in the flash fiction process is that you, you then have to sculpt your idea and make it just incredibly like um, precise. And um, I actually, can I share with you an exercise that I have my students do that I think will sort of exemplify that? Absolutely. Yeah, yes, please. please Okay, so this is, so I'll tell you what the exercise is and then I'll read my version of that. So the exercise is really, and this is coming about halfway through the book in that sculpting section. Um, The exercise is to whatever it is, whatever story piece, whatever it is you're working on, to see what the word count is, whatever that may be, if it's 500 words, whatever, and then cut it in half. So whatever it is, you have to cut it in half. And then you have to cut it in half again. So it's really like at at first, like writers are like, ah, you know, and and I think the first thing a writer will do is they'll start, okay, I have to cut this in half. And they'll just like really, really painstakingly take out like three words here and four words here and and then realize this is never going to get me to half. So I better just start like changing my attitude here and just start chunking whole things out of there you know like taking out whole paragraphs and and that's kind of the shift that needs to happen because I think when we're really attached to everything and we're only willing to let go of three or four words we can't actually see that like wait a minute that whole paragraph can go and if we started on this second paragraph instead whoa like look how cool that is you know so um so I have I have writers do that cut it in half 
and then they feel really good about themselves and then I have them cut it in half again um, in which then kind of leaves three versions of a story and you can sort of see what happens as you walk through each version and how it shrinks so um, I'm going to read uh, myself doing that exercise with a story of my own uh, because I felt like it wasn't fair to tell my students to do this and then not do it myself so um, <laughs> I did this to a story that was originally 238 words, and so then I cut it, and then I cut it again, and I'll read all three versions. So I'll read the first version, and then the second version, and then the third version, and then you'll be able to kind of hear what happens as we go down. So this is a story called Death Row Hugger, and um, it was published in a book of mine called The Vixen's Scream and Other Bible Stories about four or five years ago. And um, so this first version is the published version, and it is 238 words. So here, here it goes. Death Row Hugger. For some reason, it's always at night. It's always in the same room. The light is always jauntous. The room smells musty, like wet clothes were shoved and left to die in all the corners. I guess I was destined for this job. My parents weren't the hugging type, so I've always had a malnourished craving for arms around me. I started out as a professional baby cuddler for the preemie babies in the NIC ICU. Each night after visiting hours, I settled into the wooden rocking chair with these miniature babies and their ancient sculpted faces, and I whispered of a future when they would be strong and full-sized. But nothing could prepare me for being a volunteer hugger on death row. You enter that holding room and there they are, trying to enjoy their steaks or lobsters or Cuban cigars or whatever. My job is to hug them just before they take that long walk. It's not a sexual hug, but a few have tried to kiss me. And I politely turn my cheek and I squeeze them harder. Because there's this moment in the hug, you see, where it goes from something awkward and obligatory to when they melt into my arms, weeping with their bodies, if not with their eyes. Every now and then I hear one of them whisper in my ear, and once one called me Mama. And then this is the version cut in half, so this is down to 127 words. It's always at night. The light is always jauntous. The room smells musty, like wet clothes were shoved and left to die in all the corners. I guess I was destined for this job. My parents weren't the hugging type, so I've always craved arms around me. But nothing could prepare me for being a volunteer hugger on death row. There they are, trying to enjoy their steaks or lobsters or Cuban cigars or whatever. And there's this moment in the hug you see where it goes from something awkward and obligatory to when they melt into my arms, weeping with their bodies, if not with their eyes. Every now and then I hear one of them whisper in my ear, and once one called me Mama. And then the final version is 67 words. It's always at night. The light is always jauntist. The room smells musty like wet clothes were shoved and left to die in all the corners. There they are, trying to enjoy their steaks or lobsters or Cuban cigars. And there's this moment in the hug where it goes from something awkward and obligatory to when they melt into my arms, weeping. Once one called me mama. Well done. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was just yeah. going to say, I just love watching the shrinking process happen. Because I loved, uh, as you were reading it I loved like all of the little atmospheric bits in it like I really liked that you kept the line um it, it was night and the light was jaunty in every single bit and I sort of as you read the first one I was kind of placing bets on okay which lines is she going to keep which ones really stand out and I think yeah I just really love it especially the last line as well one time they call me mama I thought that that's so harrowing and I think the best flash fiction is the one that really stays with you and kind of makes you want to go and google a topic like whenever i read flash fiction if there's one that makes like now i want to go and google is there actually a volunteer hugger at the at death row and stuff like that and you it really really makes me think at the end of it so yeah i really like that thank you 
I, it gave me chills actually it was really yeah. really well written and I did also really like the about the light being light being jaundiced but also the wet clothes gave me a really powerful mm. image like the clothes have been sent to die they have all they're also being sent to die mm. so that's that was a really cool parallel um no I I had a I was wondering which bit you would take out and for some reason I didn't expect you to take out the middle bit with the with hugging babies um but when when you did I understood why you'd taken that out it made the most sense um no that was a really cool exercise I really liked that and I really liked the final product as well I, lo I really loved the first product and I really liked the final product it was really powerful to see which bits were important and to still almost get the same story but much much smaller and I think I mean I really think in some ways it ends up like three different versions of the story because I think that they all mm. end up with a slightly different tone like you said like the the second and the third I had to cut the whole backstory completely you know and um yeah it was it was really interesting for me to do it especially with a piece that was published because I was like um, wait a minute, you know, like it was perfect. And, but, but no, I think it's, there's always like another thing you can do. I love this, um, quote by Picasso that says something to the effect of like a painting's never finished. It just stops in interesting places. And I think like all creative work is kind of like that. You know, we could, we could keep going forever on anything, but we stop in a place that's sort of interesting, you know? Well, thanks for letting me share that. And then, I mean, really, the book, though, that's one of the very few instances where I actually share an actual flash fiction piece. Almost all of the book is really talking about it. Um, but that felt like a section where I really wanted to demonstrate. So I don't do a whole lot of demonstrating. I mostly just kind of turn it back to the reader to try this, you know, or, or think about this. But um, I, I really liked adding that in there. Yeah. And how do we get the book? How do we yeah. sign up yes. to it? So um, Ad Hoc Fiction is the publisher, Ad Hoc, H-O-C, Fiction. And um, so you can get it from their website. They're doing, um, up until Thursday, it's still free shipping. Um, and especially if it's in the UK, that might be the fastest way. Um, and then Amazon, and um, I'm thinking about doing an audio recording of it so I can um, create an audio book at some point, maybe by the end of the year as well. Also, my website, um, which is nancystolman.com, S-T-O-H-L-M-A-N. Um, I've got links there, and I can send, um, people want me to send them like signed copies, so I can do that. I can't do free shipping, but I can sign it and put little hearts in it and send it off to you, and that's really fun too. So those would be the easiest ways, I would say, right now, is me, Ad Hoc, and Amazon. <laughs> and also on your website, there is the Flash Nano Challenge. Yay, Flash Nano, yes. Which is just <laughs> like a perfect thing for this podcast to talk about because this is, so Flash Nano is in November, it's a sister, um, challenge to the NaNoWriMo challenge, which probably your readers know about. Um, but if you don't, for some reason, it's the, the November challenge to write a novel in a month. Um, they define novel as 50,000 words, so write 50,000 words in a month. And um, as I was telling you guys earlier, uh, back in 2012, again, apparently a lot of things happened in 2012 for me. Um, back in 2012, when NaNoWriMo was coming around, I have done it multiple times and always loved it. I just think it's a, a great challenge. So it was coming up to November and my friend was asking, are you gonna be doing the NaNoWriMo challenge? And I just, I, as I was talking about earlier with this whole idea of like the lens, I was in flash fiction world. I was in a flash fiction lens. I was thinking about flash fiction. There was no way I was switching to write a novel. I just wasn't in the right headspace for that. I just wanted to write more flash fiction. And so I said, you know, what if I did a, what if I just wrote like a flash fiction piece every day in November? And she, who was also writing flash fiction, said, oh, yeah, I would do that. She's like, I would especially do that if you wanted to send me a prompt every day. And I was like, you know what? Challenge accepted. I will send you a prompt every day. And so that was the first year. And I sent her a prompt every day. But then I also just posted it on my social media. And then people are like, what is this? And so that was the first flash nano. And then every year since, I've just kept doing it. And every year, it just gets bigger and bigger. So there's I don't know, there's probably like a couple thousand people that do it now. 
and every year it grows and every year I get a bunch of people like coming to my website and like signing up and I send emails every day with a prompt in them and then I put them on social media and I mean it's really fun because again the theme we talked about before where some people think flash fiction might be easier um some people think that flash nano is going to be easier and they're like oh yeah i'll just do that instead because i i don't have it you know i i i could never write a novel but i could certainly write 30 flash fiction pieces and then you end up realizing the short-sightedness of that assumption as well where it's like oh wait i have to come up with 30 brand new ideas every day and like bring them to completion so um it's really equally as challenging and fun and perfect for somebody who's kind of in um, a short fiction world rather than feeling like they're in that um, long fiction space. So uh, yeah, so it's coming up. It's like three weeks away now and I've already got people like getting excited and I'm excited. So <laughs> I'm actually even taking for the first year ever, I'm, um, I'm taking uh, suggestions for prompts from people, especially people who've done it before. So I'll feature some of the best prompt suggestions that I get as well. Where do you get your prompts from? Because ours are always just weird things that we've heard around. Yeah, I literally <laughs> get them when I wake up in the morning and I sit down at my computer and I'm like, I must come up with a prompt right now. And it's really whatever shows up in my head. So sometimes, you know, I have to walk around my house and sometimes I think of one the day before and I write it down for that morning. But um, I, I really just try to think about like, what am I feeling today? Um, what did I notice yesterday? Like what's on my mind today? And just sort of hope that there's some resonance around that. Um, so yeah, by the end of the month, it gets pretty challenging <laughs> because I have to come up with 30 prompts and, uh, yeah, the first week is glorious. And then, you know, by about day 25, I'm like, Oh God, I'm like, anybody, please give me a prompt. You know, so. <laughs> I definitely relate to that. When we first started Prompted, I had a whole book full of potential prompts, which is just every time someone said something interesting, I'd write down exactly what they said and it sort of sum up their character. And then now that we're on series three, it is always a mad panic of just messaging loads of people or searching through my messages and just seeing what's, <laughs> what, what sort of interesting mm -hmm. prompts can be used. Because it is hard getting a prompt sometimes because you've got to come up with something that's going to be thought provoking can sort of capture characters and can really sort of capture a theme but then also people can do whatever they want with it and so yeah so it's just a fun process of selecting prompts right and and my style of prompts has really been to keep it very very open-ended because i sort of mm. feel like um the, the kind of prompts that I respond best to are the ones that just have a slight hint of like an idea, but without being like, you know, a man walks down the street, he sees somebody coming, he looks in the window, blah, blah, blah. And the, you know, now that's your prompt. And it's like, wait a minute, you gave me too much. Like, I don't have any room to be, you know, myself here. So my prompts can be like as simple as write a story that features the color orange, you know, and then people can take that in a million different directions. It can be like a slight mention of the color orange. It could be an orange. It can be like a redhead. It could be, you know, any number of things. And so I really try to keep them like open enough that they could create many, many, many different sorts of stories in the end. Yeah, because I saw one of your prompts from last year is something about write a story that contains a red jumper. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And I thought that was because so many different characters could have that lying around. And so it's so relatable and so open ended. Right. Yeah. And then I'll do some of the prompts will be like, take yesterday's story and cut it in half, you know, or um, <laughs> write a story that's exactly 75 words or something like that, you know, so some of them will be content prompts and some of them will be more like structure or form kind of prompts that's quite educational as well it's good practice for sort of finding your own style and structure and and things like that that I really like that it's a lot of fun but it's by the end of November I'm like whoo I am beat you know and I've always got people <laughs> you know who are like I did it every day as a matter of fact now that it's been going on for so long I have people every year tell me like I wrote a prompt you know, I wrote a story every day in November. I have 30 stories. I put them together in a chat book and it's coming out and I'm dedicating it to you. You know, And I'm like, wow. So there's been many, many published stories, but now even like 
whole books. People have decided to write whole flash novels, like using the prompts to like take us through like a big story arc. So um, now I just have people like lining up, like, all right, ready to write for November. Do you also join Um, in every year? I try to, but the problem is, is that um, I kind of have to write either before or after the prompt because when I'm in it, I'm just like thinking about the prompt and like managing it. So what I usually end up doing is sometimes I can write the same day as the prompt, but I usually have to go back and do it later, like when I'm not in it. So December tends to be the month where then I go back and write a lot. Yeah. So talking about you writing... um, what was what was the first thing you ever wrote you ever published mm. that mm-hmm. yeah well that's sort of the first fiction thing that I started publishing was in um, grad school. So I was in grad school and that's actually where I discovered flash fiction. I had written um, before I found flash fiction I had been writing novels a lot of novels and I've written three or four novels unpublished and um, that was excellent practice of course but I would never ever want anybody to read them now and um, so it really wasn't until I discovered flash fiction and kind of was able to take everything I'd learned from writing novels and like put it into this new form that I kind of found my sweet spot so that's actually when I started publishing and so it was really many years after I had been writing if you want to think about writing since childhood even. But um, I think a big shift for me, because people are always kind of curious about publication and how does one go about that. And I think that there's such an, a, I would say, antiquated idea around that, that you have to like write a big thing, like a novel, and then you have to get an agent, and then that agent is going to sell it. And there's this like one very kind of traditional path to... Uh, publication and I just don't think that that's accurate anymore and I think that the best thing that you can do is to just kind of get your work out there by any means necessary really but um, my very first book um, I published it with a small publisher uh, Monkey Puzzle Press who's uh, non-existent anymore but um, but I had gone for years thinking that I had to like find the agent and like have them do it this way and And then he had this small press and he was like, let me see your book. You know, maybe I'll publish it. And there was this little part of me that's like, oh, but you're a small publisher. You're not like the big publisher and I have to do it this way, you know. And then I realized, wait a minute, like this is a way for my work to actually get into people's hands. And that is far more important than like any old ideas about what publishing is supposed to look like. So I gave him the book. He wanted to publish it. I did it. And it was awesome because it was like all of a sudden I had a book published that people could read and buy and talk about. And um, that to me is so much more important. I I really think that nowadays with online journals and, and just so many outlets that people should get as creative in the way that they publish as they are in the way that they write. And so I would say just kind of forget about that old traditional narrative. I don't think that's really true for a lot of people anymore. They kind of dangle it as if it's the only way, but I just don't think it's the way. I've I've never gone that way, and I've published many books now. And I feel really happy with my career at this point. And I feel like every time that I've published, whether that's with like an online journal, like publishing a story or whatever, um, that I'm dealing with real people, Um, with real like interest in literature and that I'm creating relationships with those people and I think that in the end it's really about relationships with people in this publishing industry so um, don't don't shy away from publishing your chat book or your pamphlet with like a small press that's just getting started you know because they could be so excited to promote your work as opposed to like letting it get lost in the black void of you know traditional publishing. That's some really good advice, actually. I'd never really thought about it that way, especially with the way sort of social media has grown now. It's there's another interesting sort of format of getting work out there as well. Um, there's not just the traditional try and get into sort of Penguin, right, and get it published by mm. Penguin, or you know, I've I've always thought that like 
the penguin was the one you always saw growing up and I've wanted to write since I was so young that it's been like oh I want to be published by penguin but that's just one publisher that exists and there's you know so many more people who might actually be a better fit and a better might be more help than say a big corporation absolutely Um, and my publisher for this book ad hoc um, they focus completely on flash fiction. And so for me, it was more important to have a publisher that got it, that I didn't have to explain the merits mm. of flash fiction and try to convince them that this was going to be a good book, that they immediately knew why and and yes, and they were like ready and on it. That to me is just far more valuable than like attempting to get Penguin to believe me that people, you know, like flash fiction and that there's, you know, all the things that I would have to say. Um, like, yeah, I, I think really thinking about these are long term relationships that you're making too. I suppose it's about getting the right fit for the right book and the right author as well and just the people who you're comfortable working with. Whether you're published or not, if you're a writer, you're a writer. If you're a writer, you're like you claim it. You're a writer right now. It doesn't matter if you're published or not. And I think so many people are waiting for this like stamp of approval to like feel like they're a real writer. But you know, and yes, it feels lovely to have somebody else like validate you from the outside. But you are no better of a writer before or after. Like, so I think that sometimes people put all their energy into like, if I'm not published, I'm not a real writer. And even, you know, the first question is often, are you published as we saw in one of the stories? And, um, and that is not what makes you a good writer. Like sometimes writers don't publish for years. You know, I think of Charles Bukowski who didn't publish anything till he was in his fifties, but that didn't mean he wasn't a real writer before that. So, um, yeah, like just remember that you're a writer right now. Yeah. That's a really, really powerful thing to leave off on. Um, unfortunately we have to wrap up, which is such a shame because it's been so exciting to have Nancy on with us and I kind of don't want it to end. Um, (laughs) but Sadly, this episode is coming to an end and I'd like to say thank you so much for all our writers on today's show and thank you so much to everyone for listening. A special thanks to Nancy Stallman for joining us today. Um, seriously, a special thanks, Nancy. It's been amazing. Um, please Yay, remember thank to... Thank you. Yes, please remember to uh, look into Nancy's book, which we said was found on Amazon or with Ad Hoc Publishing or Nancy Stallman at nancystallman.com. Um, so you can pre-order though you might even get it sooner than that because it's being sent out now Um, to support Prompted please subscribe to our Patreon which is www.patreon.com slash Prompted Writing Podcast there we do bonus content and shout outs and please follow our YouTube which is Prompted Writing Podcast be sure to leave us a review telling us what you think and for more prompts and writing find us on Instagram at Prompted Writing Podcast Thanks so much for listening.